Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started here in just a couple of minutes. I want to give everyone a chance to get here. Um, people who are maybe running a little bit, a little bit late. Um, maybe I'll make an announcement while we're, we're doing that. So welcome, everyone. I hope everybody's feeling well and, and, and doing all right, being sequestered in their homes. Um, we have a lot of people joining us from the Rec Innovation Lab tonight. We also have students uh, joining from SDSU and from Miramar, and um, you're all very welcome to come. Um, if you are one of the um, Gazelle Path uh, teams in the in the Rec Innovation Lab, um, I, I would ask that uh, you can either stick around after uh, the um, after the workshop if you have any questions for me. Um, otherwise, I will, um, I'll be sending a, a message out soon. I'd love it if we could uh, book some one-on-one um, -on -one meetings in the next, uh, next week or so. So that'd be great if, uh, if you, you could, uh, I'll, I'll send a message out so you can just respond to that. So well, I think we can get started here pretty soon. Ryan, are you, are you on? I think his microphone. Yep, I'm here. Oh, hi, Ryan. Welcome, welcome. So I'd like to introduce Ryan uh, Vancher, who uh, is a former student of, of mine and a successful entrepreneur, co-founder of Course Key, who's going to be talking to us tonight about uh, some, of the, some of the things that we can do to build a team when we don't have a lot of money to pay for a team. So um, with that, I think I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Ryan, if you'd like to take it away. Yep, sure. And can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, I can see your screen. Yep. Awesome. Okay, um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Usually um, with uh, tools like this, the um, chat room is a good place to ask questions while everybody's muted. Um, sometimes at the end, you know, there might be some room for some Q&A, but typically it's a good place to submit those chats. Um, Tanya will probably be keeping an eye out for that, and so she'll probably jump in and help kind of moderate as things pop up. Um, but basically what I want to do is kind of walk everybody through, um, not necessarily a prescriptive formula where, you know, this is a step-by-step -step on how to build a team because there's no, you know, one play book essentially that does that, but there are certain things that you can do to build yourself and, and, and create an environment that attracts the type of people that you want into your business. Um, and depending on the types of resources you have, there's a lot of student entrepreneurs on this call and us being, you know, a, a Student Entrepreneurship Center, I'm going to focus more around, you know, our story as course key, um, specifically because we built, you know, our business while we were students in between classes, using other people's resources, like other people's time, other people's efforts, um, other people's expertise. And so when you're strapped and don't have a big budget, basically that, you know, how innovative you can be and, and you know, how resourceful you can be is going to determine your success more so than you know, how much money do you have in your bank to start a business? Um, so just to kind of kick things off, you know, my name is Ryan Bancher. I'm a co-founder of Course Key. There's a handful of us from San Diego State that started this. Um, and Course Key is, a, as of today, <laughs> a live online teaching and engagement platform. Um, there's a lot of changes happening right now with the way education is being delivered. And so we used to be a purely ground uh, kind of brick and mortar attendance tool. Uh, and we've, you know, as most startups have to do, have quickly pivoted into a live, live online teaching tool to help support our clients and other schools that are trying to start teaching online, um, but still need to have that, that engagement and face-to-face -face interaction. Um, we serve vocational training schools, uh, two-year schools and four-year schools all around the country. Um, and we started at San Diego State in 2014. So it's not like we've been doing this for a while. You know, we're about six years into our business. Um, and so today we're, we're quickly approaching becoming a $20 million company. We're about 20 to, you know, 25 employees. We actually, unfortunately had to let a few people go today with the way things are going right now with the market. Um, so we're, again, we're still very much a, a smaller business, um, still going through typical startup struggles, but I want to take this kind of back to how we built our company in between those classes and, and what resources we found, um, as students that were available. Um, the nice thing about the Regional Entrepreneurship Center, which is the sponsor and hosted this specific webinar, is we're open to everybody. So if you're on here just trying to figure out what else you can do, um, hopefully I'll cover a few things, you know, outside of just specific school resources um, that I've also found as I've been growing the business since we've graduated, 
that are also useful. So I'm trying to make sure there's a little bit of something for everybody. Um, but to start off, I wanted to kind of tell a story. And one of the reasons why I started with this kind of wall picture here in, term of, in terms of forming the team um, is a story that I like that, that actually Will Smith told. And so Will Smith used to tell this story, and he, you probably have heard it, um, about how his dad used to own a bakery. And when he was young, um, one summer, his dad wanted to put up a new wall in front of his shop. Uh, and so him and his brother ended up having to basically replace a 16 foot high by 30 foot long wall um, that his dad just knocked down. And so they had to dig like a six foot hole the length of that. Um, and it took him, he said, about a year and a half to complete it. Um, and when he started, he thought that, you know, this this hole in the ground was going to be there forever. And, you know, what ended up happening was 18 months later, they laid the last brick. Um, and, and so the moral of his story was that you you know, you build the wall by focusing on placing each brick perfectly. Um, and it, that the process of building the wall is more important than the prize of completing it because every brick counts to get to a great solid foundation of a wall. And so you got to approach your, your team building in the same way, especially if you're an early company with little resources. Sometimes you just have to think brick by brick, right? What's the next brick that I need that needs to be perfect in order for me to get a little bit further in this wall that might not you might not be able to see the finish line but you have to know that you're taking small incremental steps to get there and so this is more of a, a compound interest strategy when it comes to building your team and so what i wanted to do is make sure that we gave you guys a lot of kind of tips and tricks on um, how to best position your business and position yourselves to not only attract talent but prepare yourselves for when the opportunities come when you actually need them because the market demands it okay so the first thing I like to start with here is this quote. Um, it basically says, hiring the wrong team is the third most common reason startups fail. And this is from CB Insights. It's a survey they did of about 500 startup companies um, that were going through different types of programs, incubators, and organizations. Um, and basically, this is, this is really true for a number of reasons, right? Um, when you're a startup or a small business, every hire or team member that you add, whether paid or unpaid, down to the intern matters just because everybody is a high impact employee at that point. And so if I have 100 employees today and one leaves, I'm at 99% capacity. But if I only have four, like our original founding team did and somebody took off, we're at 75% capacity. And a lot of the times there's multiple hats being worn, right? And so um, sometimes you could pick up the slack, sometimes you can't, but when one person fails or one person doesn't hit a milestone or one person isn't a good culture fit and you make the wrong hire very early on, those, those are one of the most common ways to start and think a company. Um, and so what we want to do is hopefully give you guys some, some ways to hopefully filter out some people that might not be the best fit and help you find ways to, to try to identify what a good fit might be for you, your business, and the culture you're trying to build. Um, so one thing that I can tell you, you know, if, if you're not careful, um, startups can become a springboard for learning really key skills that you actually need to get better jobs. And so we had to deal with this early on at Corsky when I was in charge of sales, when we didn't have a huge budget for salaries. So we had to pay for the people, you know, that we could at like startup entry level sales positions. But a lot of the times, you know, we needed them to get good quick. So we invested a lot in training and upfront resources only to find that, you know, six months later, they left for a higher paying job because they got the experience and the skill set they needed to do that from us. And so you have to be wary of who you bring on the team, what their intentions are. Uh, and so identifying the right type of person um, for whatever, you know, key um, area you're trying to fill is going to matter. But regardless of skill set, you know, when you're really early in a company's life cycle, it actually takes a certain type of person more than it takes a specific skill set really early on. And what I mean by that is like, you don't need a salesperson as much early on as you need someone who's self-driven and persistent, right? And so sometimes you're just looking for, you know, key characteristics or traits, right? And I think, you know, maybe there's, we'll do some workshops like on disc assessments and different ways that you can actually try to, to measure people through an application process. Um, but, but it does take certain types of people to be successful in a business very early on. Um, versus people with specific skill sets. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so really what you want to ask yourself is, is first kind of, you have to have this conversation with yourself and understand this, right? Not 
with working for a startup is not for everybody. And so you have to ask yourself, why would anyone want to join a startup? Right. Um, and if you can't recruit, which is kind of the basis for this is understanding what it takes to be a recruiter or what makes, you know, a, a position attractive, you're not going to build a great team. And so you have to be good at recruiting and, and recruiting isn't something that you do after the market tells you you need this. This is a proactive strategy. This is something you're doing as the, the leader of your business all the time, whether you're at a supermarket and you bump into somebody who gives you a business card that says they're a salesperson and you think maybe I can use them later, or maybe you're at a school campus at the incubator and another person walks in looking for a team and they happen to be, you know, great vibe, you know, great, great culture fit. And, you know, you find an opportunity there. Recruiting is something you're doing all the time, all the time. Right. And so when I'm out and about, especially early on, I was always looking for people that might have been able to help our business, especially students who might be looking for extra work and want to have something that they can pad up the resume with. Uh, you know, students looking for projects, you know, in certain types of classes for their senior project. There was a lot of things that we went out and found um, that we were able to do, but we had to recruit all these people in order to do that. Nobody just shows up, pardon my language, for a shitty story. Like nobody's coming out for it. So you guys have to be able to create a story regardless of the differences between a startup and a normal job. And so the, the bad story is that startups are long and unpredictable hours and constant change, right? And a normal job to somebody, you know, more logical, it's, it's, it's reasonable, predictable hours and consistency, right? And so this is what you're competing against. You've got to understand what your competition is. It's great individual responsibility when you're in a startup. As I mentioned, if you're, you know, you're one of 10 and you fail and you're the reason you don't get funding, you feel that, right? Whereas maybe at a larger corporation, you can, you know, call out sick and, and nobody's going to panic and the company's not going to collapse, right? And so there's a big shared responsibility when you're in a normal, you know, corporate type job. Um, there's also, you know, minimal, we call it minimal viable compensation, right? And minimal viable job security. Um, when we started out at course key, we were all 1099 contractors and we were all subject to be fired at the discretion of the company. And we all paid ourselves as little as we could possibly pay ourselves in order to put more money into the business to grow our, our business. And so you can't offer, you know, competitive market pay with a, with a fortune 500 company. You can't offer the benefits, you know, you can't offer, um, you know, the 401ks and you can't guarantee positions, right? Because startups, you know, change all the time. I just mentioned we had to let four people go this morning um, just because we woke up Monday and it's a different market than it was last week. Um, and there's, you know, we don't know when that's going to end. So we, businesses have to make decisions. And as a startup, that is a risk you take by joining a startup right? Versus, you know, maybe better compensation and you feel a little more, you know, job security. Now, you know, in, in certain markets, like right now, you might be hearing, you know, unemployment's going to get pretty bad. And so sometimes you have to ask yourself, how much job security do you really have, right? In a situation like this. Um, and so there, there's, while it might seem like these are all pros, there's also benefits to the startup side. You know, eventually equity might be worth something. Right. I can't go buy toilet paper right now with what my stock, you know, is sitting on a piece of paper is, is, you know, doing. But until I cash that out and the company becomes profitable and that stock is worth something, then, you know, maybe at that point, this of all would have been worth it versus, you know, if the, if the business goes under these, you don't have personal ownership, you can go get a new job. You don't have to take on the risk of the failure. The only thing you lose is your job. You know, you don't lose your company, your livelihood and have to fire hundreds of people. So it's just a little less, you know, stressful at a normal job and a lot more stressful at a startup. And obviously, statistically, everybody knows startups are very likely to fail, right? In a more established company, you, you can kind of walk in and start climbing the ladder versus worrying about whether there's gonna be a ladder to climb in a few years. And so this is what you're, you're recruiting against. You're recruiting against somebody who's looking for safe, somebody who's looking for um, you know, predictable, somebody who's looking for you know, less risk. And so when I say you're looking for a type of person, you have to be aware of what types of people you don't want as well, right? And so with my sales background, I know it's just as important to find out who you don't want to sell to as it is to figure it out who you want to sell to. And it's the same thing with recruiting. It's very similar. And so once you understand that the people you're looking for want great individual responsibility, you know, they want to be able to have, you know, a very long-term lucrative reward at the risk of, you know, short-term deferment of, you know, reward, right? Um, they're okay with high risk because they like, you know, the rush of building the business, right? Or they love going and learning new things, right? And so this should start to tell you who it is you're keeping an eye out for while you're recruiting and going about your day, whether you're at the grocery store or in class or at a, at a workshop or a conference or a webinar, 
um, always be thinking about people who match some of these criteria and where this is going to be an easy sell versus trying to convince somebody who's looking for this to come join your team because you're, you're going to invest in somebody who won't be there in the long term. So this is just kind of the comparison between you as a business owner, maybe as a student, trying to understand what is it you're actually offering. You're offering this. It just doesn't sound great to everybody. And so you need to filter out who those people are as you start looking at recruiting. All right. So aside from that, there's a few core competencies that I, that I think, you know, have always helped us. And I want to kind of go over what those look like. Um, and so one is, as I had mentioned, don't necessarily worry about, you know, the, the skill set. Like you don't need somebody who's an accounting major, right? That's not what you're looking at when you're really early as, as a student company or just starting out. What you're looking for is somebody who can, who can fill core competencies, right? And so uh, if you're, for example, developing technology, you know, some core competencies might be able, you know, might be you have some experience developing an application, right? If I'm looking for a technical developer to join our team as a co-founder, you might have to have experience being a project manager, right? And making sure that you know how to mobilize resources and track projects from start to finish and help report to the leadership when resources are needed or when risks come up so we can help jump in and, and help minimize that. Right. And so one, you want to make sure you identify your core competencies. And, and so a lot of the times, if you're if you're used to being a job seeker, you're trained to think in terms of titles. Right. And so in other words, um, you, you're specializing in skills that you can put on your, your resume so that you can obtain degrees and certifications to prepare yourselves for, you know, whatever the popular and well-defined corporate role is. Um, but when you're hiring for the startup, you have to kind of shed all those beliefs and shift your perspective a little bit. Titles are now really irrelevant. They don't really matter. And instead, what you need to assume is you need to hire, you don't need to hire a specific title. You need to hire by mapping out a specific outcome, right? So what is it you need to have planned? You don't need somebody who's the chief of marketing if they can't build you a website and all you need is a website, right? You might just need somebody who's a website designer. Um, and so what you're looking for is somebody who can produce the outcome your business needs to get you to the next step, not the fanciest title that comes through when you post that you have a startup company and are looking for help. Okay. So that's just one thing I wanted to make sure you guys, there's a distinct difference between core competencies and what you're trying to achieve as a business and the technical skills that somebody has that might not be relevant, right? There's no point in, we call it paying for unused features, right? Hiring somebody who, who does a, a lot of cool stuff but none of what you need them to do to, to advance your company early on, right? And so um, just understand that small difference there. Now, before you think about titles, you need to ask yourself questions to identify your core competencies. Questions need to be asked, like, and write these down, right? So these are good questions to ask while you're thinking about who you should be hiring and why, right? So what immediate actions will have the biggest impact in helping our business achieve our goal, right? That's the first one you should ask. And then which aspects of my business would benefit from someone else taking it over, right? Whether it's things you're mediocre at as a leader or just things you're terrible at doing, like, you know, spreadsheets and, and you know, writing out long reports. I hate it. I'm terrible at it. So we have somebody who does that. But training our clients and, and getting on webinars and, and helping people educate themselves to be more successful with course key, I love it, right? So I take that on myself. And then ask yourself also, if you're bringing somebody on the team, what would that person need to accomplish within six months of starting for you to consider them to be a successful hire? Because you have to know how to measure this person's impact. And we'll talk about, you know, salaries and compensation later. And you want to make sure that you're attracting good talent, but you need to be able to, to convince yourself and have it proven through data that they are. So what would it take for that person within six months to prove, you know, that they were a successful hire? So basically you need to determine your objectives and then work backwards from there. And then you can start to evaluate skills and traits and probability of reaching goals after you've got your milestones laid out, but hire to hit your milestones. Don't hire for titles. Okay. Now the next one is separate must haves from nice to haves and in early startups, you know, to me, cultural fit is about as must have trait as you can get when you're comparing it to candidates experience. Uh, which is more of a nice to have, right? If you have 10 years of experience at a company, that's great. But if you're not comfortable working in ambiguous environments and you're not, you know, uh, up to date on, you know, the latest technology that's being used for a specific role or, or function, um, then we might have a cultural fit, right? And so sometimes there's things earlier that are necessary 
that are must haves that are nice to haves uh, or that can become must haves later as a business. Right. So in your, when we're talking about early startups, some of the must haves that you want to have is, is obviously, you know, culture fit, but you can't always, I guess you can't always hire a hundred percent of everybody on spot, right? So you need to have a best guess at what your most ideal candidate looks like. Now, the way that I did this, and I'm going to give you guys this book, you know, that, that um, I read when I, when I set up our hiring process is it's called who the a method for hiring. So uh, W H O is the name of the book. And then the little subtitle is the a method for hiring. And what that book does is it basically helps you create like a, a grade sheet or a scorecard for candidates based upon the competencies, which you identified in step one, that'll help you determine whether or not you're getting the features that you need from this person. So I'm going to give you the story of how we use this and how I got Ashley, right? So Ashley is our cu customer support manager. And I had been in charge of this for a while because I was building out this program, this new client success program and, and technical support was our first step. And so I needed somebody that, that knew more than me to come in, take over what I had built and then continuously keep building. Right. And so from a competency standpoint, we had four key competencies that we needed. One, they had to have, you know, a customer first attitude. Now there's different traits that can, that can be considered a customer first attitude. And I'll talk about those in a second, but our four competencies were a customer first attitude, proactive management of cust of technical support, ability to build help center articles and knowledge based documentation. And there was one other one, which was culture fit. As I mentioned, that's always in there for us. Now underneath those four, there were very specific things that we expected that person to do. So for culture fit, we had three traits. And the three traits that told you you were a culture fit and we would grade these were, you know, uh, ability to, you know, shift focus based on the company's, you know, uh, goals, right? Um, you know, willing to invest in the long run and a team player, right? There were specific traits that we thought would add up to these competencies that we were going for. And then once our, our hiring team, or if it was just you as the leader of the company, once you've got your scorecards kind of drawn up and, and what I'd like to do, Tanya, take a note is to do a workshop on this later. Um, I actually have a full workshop where I go through this hiring program specifically on how to draft your scorecard, prep your hiring process. And then it's part of the, the extension of this, which is build your funnel. Um, and so I can kind of go through those who want to do the follow up workshop on how to exactly build that out. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Now, the next thing is create an amazing job description. And again, you notice back on this slide, there's, there's somebody who's going to hate this startup description and somebody who's going to love the startup description. And you're not drafting it for the person who's going to hate it. You're drafting it for the person who's going to love it. And so some are going to hate it, some are going to love it, and you're looking for the ones who respond. So a good job description is polarizing. And it needs, you need to make it that way because you're really trying to, to filter in that description and weed away candidates who are not comfortable with what the type of environment a startup entails when you work and it is. So make sure you have a good job description. And again, these are all like entire workshops in and of themselves. But for us, we would use job descriptions at this point that are probably a little more because we, we've been recently trying to hire people smarter than us. So we've adjusted our job descriptions to be more about how we're a maturing company with growing processes and looking for, you know, great leadership to come in and help us take it to the next level. We weren't always writing those job descriptions. They used to be, you know, the, the quirky job descriptions that said, you know, we need somebody who's willing to get a, a door slammed in your face, you know, up to a hundred times a day and be told that, you know, to, to get out of their face, right? And we would just literally write the opposite of what somebody who's looking for a corporate job would want to see if we can find those few people who are actually a great fit, you know, intuitively for a startup. And so don't be afraid to have fun with it and A-B test these. There's nothing wrong with putting out two different versions and seeing what your best responses are and trying them at a bunch of different channels. So when it comes to creating the job descriptions, um, one, you, you want to make sure that you've got those core competencies identified because those need to be in there, right? And separated by must-haves from nice-to-haves because you need to list what those core competencies you need are in the description. So when that person makes the match, they latch on to it, right? And you also need to determine what can be outsourced, right? Not everything you need to hire somebody for. There's, there's a lot of, and we'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit, but you can outsource right now, especially with everybody moving to online work. I mean, Fiverr, you know, there, there's all these websites where you can hire somebody for almost no money at all and get things done. 
Um, and then once you're ready to create, you know, that kick-ass job description for the team member you really need, um, the best way to approach that is work backwards, right? And so I'm going to use a sales example for this. So let's say, you know, I'm trying to generate $50,000 a month in recurring revenue for our company, right? Um, and I'm there, I'm there right now, right? I've hit the 50,000 mark, but I need to get to 100,000 in the next six months. What I'm going to be asking myself is what tasks will I need this person to be doing in order for me to get to double that monthly revenue in the next six months? And what does that success look like, right? So that is, you know, cold calling, that's email campaigns. That's, you know, uh, that would be go to conferences and do, do workshops and booths and presentations, right? And I, so I would be looking for somebody who can achieve those specific skills. I'm not just looking for a sales guy. I'm looking for a type of sales guy. Somebody who has phone experience, somebody who can, who can host a, a digital workshop, somebody who knows what it's like to work conferences and trade shows, um, somebody who manages lead lists and pipelines and does demos, right? And so those are the types of things I would be looking for for a person and putting that into um, you know, my job description. So looking for a salesperson um, to help us double our revenue in the next six months by delivering amazing demonstrations of our, our uh, you know, first in class product all across the country to parties who were helping, you know, save education, something like that. Right. And again, this is all just kind of off the fly. You'll have to think a little bit more harder than I'm doing. Um, but the more detailed you are, the better. Right. You can't find a street if you don't know what it's called. And so you, you want people to find your business and, and find, you know, they want to be you want them to be drawn to it. And you want to repel away people that you shouldn't spend time with. You don't need to interview because they were never a good fit to begin with. And so you're using this amazing job description, not only to attract talent, but to scare, you know, non-talent away, if that makes sense. And then once you've answered all the hard questions, you know, just write out the job description in a small paragraph that emphasize, emphasizes like the most enticing aspects of the job, right? Um, you know, your work's going to matter right? We'll, we'll know whether, you know, whether you show up or not makes a huge difference to us. There's really enticing things about working in a startup that you have to decide um, your business has for the type of people you're looking for. And then this one's the more tough one, right? Especially for you guys who are early in the business and, and probably students who don't have, you know, you're on the top ramen budget living that entrepreneurship lifestyle as it is, you might not have money to hire people, right? And so neither did we. And so sometimes when we say determine compensation, that doesn't mean how much am I going to pay the person? It means how much am I willing to um, invest in that person in terms of bringing on co-founders to help build out your idea, right? Um, there's, there's this kind of misconception that just because you have a good idea that, you know, you're going you're gonna to become, you know, the next big thing. And really the idea doesn't matter if you don't have a team that can execute it. And that's why we're starting here with thinking about how you're going to build a team and what it takes to build a team and what you have to think about to find the right team. And you also have to think about early on, do I outsource and get as much as I can done with the limited budget that I have and just bootstrap this thing? That way I can keep as much ownership as I can over the longer period of time. Or you can do what we did and say, you know what, if me and Luke were the only two co-founders trying to build an app company, we would have failed because we were both business students. Not one of us can put our picture on a web page if we wanted to, right? And so we had to decide we needed more skill sets. We needed more talent and we needed more people to contribute to our dream. And to do that, you have to give them a part of the dream, right? And so we'll do another workshop that, you know, is a different than specifically, you know, building out your, your competency lists and your hiring scorecards. But there's another workshop that we'll do, you know, later on at a different date that's specifically around um, th this book called Slicing Pie. And what that does is it allows you to use the equity in your company to recruit talent, but not lose it if people don't work out. And so there's smart ways of going about offering equity early on so that you don't get yourself in trouble later on like we did, um, you know, after we had to kind of learn a hard lesson with some original founders. So there, there's a lot of lessons that will come out of this. But again, this is a high level overview of some of the things that you have to be thinking about before you can even start recruiting the team that's going to build your business. Um, and so whether, whether you're able to give them a salary or not, or give them a piece of the business, you've got to decide what you're going to do to keep the talent you need in your company and, and help build that dream that you have to, to build the business you're looking for. And some of you guys on this might be a small business that are not trying to, to bring on more co-founders. You might just be doing, you know, you already have an online business and you're just looking for ways to, to scale it up. Right. And so sometimes you don't need to give up any of your company, but you need to, you do need to have the resources to bring on the type of talent that you need, whether it's contract work or, you know, employees themselves versus, you know, owners and founders. Uh, you still have to be able to determine how much you can pay. 
So paying attention to what the market is paying, understanding, you know, what you can offer in terms of, you know, long-term reward and equity can be made up when you can't give a really high salary. Sometimes it could be a combination of both, but you really have to think through how much is this worth to your company to get to the next level and who is it going to take to do that? And then number five is nowhere to look for the talent. And so this one's a lot more important um, because once you get your job description up and you know how much, you know, they're, what, what you're going to put on there. And, and again, the best practice for startup culture is be very transparent about your, your compensation up front, right? Start people who are interested in working in startups are willing to take the risk, but they don't like to be, um, you know, they don't like to be kind of, you know, led along or, or misled, right? If you're very upfront, again, this helps you screen people who are just not a fit. So if somebody's a great startup person and they go company to company and help them be successful, but they want a hundred thousand dollars salary, you don't want to wait till the third, fourth round of interviews to find that out. Let them find that out up front and be transparent that you're giving up some equity. You don't have a hundred thousand dollars salary. So if they've got the cushion to say, you know what, I'll take the risk and take, you know, take the reward, then at least they know up front what they're getting into. But you don't want to go through all, waste all your time doing all these interviews to find out you can't afford people that would have not even applied had you had told them in the first place. So again, it's about using your time on the people that are attracted to the business, not the people that, that you know, want something you can't offer. Um, and so knowing where to look, um, we use AngelList. There's a lot of companies I know. I would check that website out. If you're a startup and don't have a profile on AngelList, just create one. It's a free, you can do the free version just to get your, your business up there. List yourself as a founder. And, and a lot of this is to make yourself more legitimate in a job seekers experience, right? If you're saying, you know, on, on some web page that you've got a job and somebody Googles you and they can't find a website, a business or anything, not even you or your LinkedIn, and there's nothing there about your company, what do you think the odds of them wanting to invest in that company is going to be versus if maybe AngelList popped up and it has your company on there as a startup with you as a founder, right? It's the appearance of legitimacy that helps people take you more serious, even when you don't necessarily have the legitimacy to begin with. This is what's really helpful about incubators, right? Uh, unfortunately, right now, everybody's kind of meeting remotely, but when you can bring people to somewhere where there's a conference room or somewhere where you have a professional environment, right, and you're not kids in the garage trying to build a business, then it, it has this appearance of legitimacy. And that was one of the things that we used at the center at San Diego State was we always had our business meetings there at the center because it was so much more professional than doing it at Starbucks or, you know, in Luke's frat house garage, right? And so one of the things you have to do is know where to look for talent. And ZipRecruiter is another tool we use all the time. Um, ZipRecruiter is a very easy tool. Now, the downside about this is it can be expensive, and ZipRecruiter usually has candidates who are looking for jobs, and you're looking for people who already have jobs, right? You're not looking for people who are bad at what they were doing and are in the job market for a long period of time. If I'm looking for a salesperson, I recruit them. I don't find them on ZipRecruiter. I'll go on LinkedIn and I'll look for people in the industry I'm working in that have sales titles that look like what I'm hiring for, and I'll slowly start to watch them and I'll stalk them. It's literally stalking. Uh, we call it recruiting, but you watch them on LinkedIn and you wait for them to post something and you contribute to it and you like it. And we socially surround these people and we eventually recruit them in the long term to our company, right? But this is something that we do before we need the jobs filled or before the jobs even get there. You kind of have to think a little bit forward and start planning for the types of people that you might need and following them and creating relationships so that you can actually recruit them to the jobs that you that you end up having versus having to pull from a list of people who are unemployed. And the reason is because you're, you're the types of people who are looking for jobs on ZipRecruiter are there looking for jobs, right? They're not necessarily looking to be co-founders of company. That's why Angels List is nice. Angels List will actually have people who are looking for that. And you can find other people who might be on other companies and teams. And if that company goes under, you can reach out and ask them if they can help. Um, Craigslist, right? Sounds crazy, but yes, you can find good candidates on Craigslist. Um, you know, whether you can go, you can go to the My Career tab or, or whatever. Um, I'm a really big fan of Craigslist, and maybe because I'm, you know, 35 at this point. But uh, like on ZipRecruiter, you'll get varying quality, and you know, you can kind of put filters on that to deal with it. Um, you know, sometimes we ask people to fill out Google forms with some fields instead of replying directly to our ads. Um, but people do search for jobs on Craigslist and it's usually people who like to take, you know, looking for multiple channels of opportunities, right? So don't, don't sleep on Craigslist. Um, 
remote.co is another one that we've looked at. And so this is like a job board that you can get a really high quality audience exclusively focused on remote work. Right. And, and this one's fairly cheap. You can start using it. I think it starts at like 200 bucks. Uh, but this is one where if you want to get, you know, overseas outsource work, that's still quality, but you can count on, this is a great resource to do that. So whether you need marketing material, a website built, you know, uh, online courses created, whatever your business model is. There's a lot of people who are working remote that can do things for cheap versus hiring here in the States and having to pay, for example, $15 an hour to, to do certain things. Um, developers, if anybody here is looking for apps, right? GitHub is a huge, huge repository where developers basically showcase their work. And so if you're, if you want to go around and post about a project you have without having to be in front of somebody, all these are remote resources, obviously giving the state of where things are today. We can't go to the center and recruit people from there, but these are online resources you can be using right now from your home to start looking for potential talent. And remember, this is a long-term game, right? This isn't like I hire, it's done. You're always hiring whether you know it or not because people will leave, they'll find new opportunities, the market will change and you'll have to fire and then grow again. Um, and so always be thinking as a business leader that recruiting is, is a, what I would call an infinite game, right? Um, there's, there's a book that I would recommend to everybody here on this call. It's by Simon Sinek. Um, and it's called The Infinite Game, basically. And, and just refers to, you know, this, this concept that, some things are, are meant to last longer than a, a period of time, right? Now, when we're talking, you know, they just shut down all the NFL and NBA games. Those are finite games. There's a first quarter, a last quarter, a start and end. There's a score. Everybody plays to win, right? Sometimes, you know, people play for fun, but nobody really plays to lose. But when the game is over, the game is over, right? And recruiting isn't like that. Recruiting is infinite. And so the, the name of the game with recruiting is to play as long as you can play. And recruiting is always happening, right? Whether you're playing or not, somebody is always recruiting. And that means there's a chance if you're not playing the game, you're falling behind when it comes to attracting and paying attention to the talent that can help your business. And so you have to understand that this is like, you know, a small investment in resources over time. Maybe it's 30 minutes every Friday to looking on LinkedIn to identify any potential candidates or, you know, going to a meetup once everything's back to normal. And, you know, handing out a few business cards to potential developers or, or attending a hackathon to try to connect, you know, with some people. Um, you need to always be recruiting, but it's not like it ends. It's not like once you hire somebody, you're done. Because if that person left the next day for a better, uh, you know, job opportunity, you're right back to square one, starting at the beginning phase, right? Getting the job description, creating your, your hiring funnel, going through your interviews. But if you always have a constant flow of potential opportunities, and you don't have to offer people jobs as much as just say, hey, I love what you're doing. And if I ever see anything, I'd love to reach out, right? And just let them know that, you know, they're on your radar. And it's not like they're going to say, you know, screw you, don't tell me if there's a great opportunity. I don't think that happens. And if they're, they're not interested, they'll say, you know what, I'm great at my job. And I'm very loyal, but I really appreciate that, you know, the compliment. Great, move on, right? But still keep an eye on them. But it, this is this is something where you guys are playing the long game. This isn't a sprint. This is a marathon. All right, so uh, this is the last one and then I wanna open it up to questions and really spend some time, you know, kind of talking through things, but you need to build a hiring funnel, right? And so I had mentioned, you know, that book, it's here, who, the A method for hiring, uh, but the hiring funnel kind of acts like a sales funnel. It, it just allows you to start screening. And the first step of the hiring funnel is pre-screening. And the purpose of pre-screening, as we said, is to kind of hopefully get rid of applicants that would be wasting your time to go too far down your hiring process. And so some pre-screening methods are writing really compelling job descriptions that scare away the types of people that you don't want and attract the people that you do, right? Some types of pre-screening are basically having qualifications and, and core competencies that you need to have. And if they don't have it, you just don't even pull them into your hiring process. And so you need to spend a lot of time, you know, weeding out the applicants that are not going to be uh, successful in your business. And there's methods to do that. And we kind of covered that earlier. Um, when we do the workshop on this, we'll, we'll do a deep dive into each of these and actually how this works with a scorecard. But the hiring funnel is, is basically a strategy that everybody uses, but it's very specific and, and it's actually prescriptive in this who method for hiring. Um, another, you know, level there in the funnel is your phone screening. Right. So once you're done pre-screening and you've got a core level of applicants that you want to engage, then you have to venture beyond the resume and answer some bigger questions about fit, skill set and experience. That's where you start doing your phone interviews. OK. Um, next, you're going to be looking at the in-person interviews or sometimes for developers, we do test projects. So once they get through the phone screening, they're a serious candidate. 
next step is usually face to face with us or a zoom or something like this. If they're, if they're thinking about moving to San Diego and they haven't done it yet, but there's always an in-person interview and we typically do it as a hiring committee at this point. Um, but it wasn't always able to, you know, we couldn't always do that. You know, this is, this book works just as well if you're a business leader trying to hire for yourself or if you're a part of a committee that's trying to hire, it just makes sure everybody's on the same page when you use that scorecard we mentioned. Um, so I would encourage you guys to show up for those other two workshops, the, the who method for hiring workshop, as well as the, the one on how to um, uh, build out your, your uh, scorecards and all that. And then reference calls. So the final step, and most people skip this because they're lazy. And I promise you, this is where I find the most issues with candidates is reference calls. And you need to call the references. Um, and sometimes you want to be able to talk to people who they don't refer. Um, we, we, sometimes I use what are called back channel references where I'll, I'll since I, search them on LinkedIn. I know who they work with. And sometimes I might just send them a LinkedIn message that says, Hey, I'm thinking about, you know, reaching out to this person, you know, before I even engage with them, just to ask them what their experience is like and, and how they like them. Right. And so depending on your comfort, you know, navigating these online platforms, um, you can get phone numbers directly from them, but just know those are usually handpicked. Um, sometimes you want to, especially this early, since we know that the number three method for business reasons failing is hiring the wrong people. You want to be very, very cautious of who you confirm and pull into the business. Um, but once they pass the reference calls, then it's just really about who made it past your funnel and what are the best candidates to complete the types of competencies that you guys want to make happen. Okay. Um, the best thing that I look for, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's called a FSO. Um, we call it the figure shit out person, right? When we're early on in our company, the people we look for the most were not who are the best students in all the programs that exist at the campus. We were looking for people who just wanted to figure shit out. And that means going and learning new things, testing new ideas, working as a team to find out the best solution. And we were looking for really people who were curious, ask great questions, uh, you know, dedicated to lifelong learning, you know, uh, serious about self and professional improvement. Those were the types of things we were hiring for at Korski very early on because the types of people you bring on first are is going to form the DNA of your company. And as you get bigger, you know, where you get 20, maybe 25 employees where we're at, you're going to start hiring people who might water down that culture. And if you establish these, these, processes now and the way that you hire and the way that you screen and the way that you validate for job fit and culture fit, then you keep using this as you scale, your culture never becomes compromised because you have a systematic, repeatable way to attract talent based on what your business needs and, and a way to, to go through that process and do it repeatedly and over time, right? And so this isn't just about getting you the first few people into your business. It's about setting you up to scale this out when your business needs start to grow when the market demands it. Okay, so now is uh, pretty much the, the wrap up of that. I hope that's, you know, it's really high level. Again, this is nothing like step one, step two, step three. There's more workshops that will come that I can help put on after this. Um, but if there's any questions, Tanya, that you saw that you want to kind of uh, tackle now, I'll kind of turn it back over to you to do the moderation. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you so much, Ryan, for, for that wonderful uh, presentation that was really, really useful. Um, I think that was helpful for a lot of people to make sure that they, they build it right from the beginning, that they establish that culture early on so that they have a system that's scalable um, as they're moving forward if they're not quite there yet. Uh, I'm looking forward to having those, uh, those other workshops um, as we move forward. And every book you've ever recommended me has been so useful. Um, but I'd like to actually um, open it up to questions uh, from, from the audience. And I'm seeing that there are some, um, some questions in the chat. Um, more recommendations. Do you have any recommendations for, for books on um, the actual process management on um, more than the hiring process? Um, so, I mean, it, that's really, it depends on what your business model is, right? So if, if you are a software as a service, you know, business like we are, then yes, absolutely. Because that's what I've spent my time studying is how do you make a software as a service enterprise level business successful? And so for those you, I mean, I would, anybody who's looking to start that level of business where you're selling to an institution, you know, for an extended period of time and licensing your software. Yes, I can recommend books all day, but if you're like doing, you know, brand apparel or sunglasses or, you know, a coffee shop or, you know, there's a million different types of businesses you could be doing, then what you need to do is 
and, and that's the first step is asking what books are good for the type of process management I need for my business. And so there's textbooks that the school can probably give you with very generic information, but there's also people who have probably spent 20 years in the industry you're trying to get into and, and have gone through the experiences you're trying to avoid that have written that in a book. And so the, the biggest thing that we did was we shortened our learning curve by learning from the best, like the guy who wrote the book on predictable revenue. That was the guy who started Salesforce, you know, their CRM company, and he took them into enterprise level startup. They were the first unicorn, you know, software as a service company. And so that was the first book I started with. How did they organize their business processes? Then he wrote another book called From Impossible to Inevitable, the, you know, the, pro, the plan for hyper growth. That was his next book, you know, and so we read that one. And so we just kept reading books about the type of business that we were trying to build and books about the industry that we were in. And eventually you end up getting to the point where you find those processes you're looking for. But I can't really make a recommendation unless I'm sitting and understand your business model and who you're trying to sell to. Right, in the particular industry, right? So I have um, see some other questions here uh, from people about uh, cultural fit. And I know you talked a lot about, about cultural fit and, and me as someone who's taught um, human resource management uh, in the past, I, I sometimes worry about that term and, and when that term uh, is, is used honestly and when it's used as, as a mask for, for just hiring people who, who think the same and act the same and, and um, who are like you. So how do you make sure that you're, um, that you have somebody who fits culturally, but you're still uh, paying attention to things like uh, diversity of um, ideas and, and diversity in general. Yeah, so so really what we found is we didn't really understand the the what we would consider a culture fit until we understood who we were, right? And so luckily for us, you know, and we, we say other people's time and resources and effort, we went through a DISC assessment workshop where as all the executive team during a retreat, we actually found out what made us tick. What, how did we react to stressful situations? How did we like to be communicated to? And then once we all understood who we were as the leaders, and th then it goes to, okay, well, if we have a bunch of high Ds in our you know, alpha guys in our, our executive team, we, then it kind of leads you to the, the real diversity that you're looking to hire for. You're not trying to hire diverse just based on, you know, if somebody's a man or a woman, you need diverse based on, you know, their, their personality traits and their skill sets and their strengths and weaknesses. And so we were hiring once we knew who we were, then we knew what a culture fit was. But I think the, the, the fakeness of it comes when a business doesn't really understand who they have as leaders or what their DNA is. And they, they hire saying that, you know, we have a great culture, but they don't even know who they are or why they function the way they do. They just respond and they go through the day to day. So first thing I would say is do a self assessment and find some way to figure out who you are and what your strengths are, because you don't want to hire a bunch of yous, right? That's not what it takes to build a business. But if you look at it from a personality, you know, from, from a, a, a more soft skill standpoint early on, um, I think it does better for building a culture because you can't build a, a culture around technical skills. Right. Absolutely. And uh, that, that is one of the uh, things that we're going to be doing here very soon is we are having workshops on uh, uh, the self assessments on uh, per personality and some of the other uh, foundations of, of entrepreneurship. So um, thanks for bringing that up. So I, I do see questions here about hiring friends or working with friends. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, that. <laughs> so the same, uh, let me see, Mireille, I hope I pronounced that right. You also ask, what is a major setback you had in your company? And so this ties into that second question you had about conflict with hiring somebody who is your friend before business partners. Uh, now, it's, it doesn't all, it's not like it's a, a black or white answer, okay? And I'm going to give you the two things that happened for us. Um, Luke, who's our co-founder and CEO, um, he hired his best friend in social, it went, from his fraternity, um, another co-founder, right? They started the business together and then they found me and then I came on. Um, that person had no real interest. It was like a school project. And so we ended up having to exit that person really quickly. Now we thought because he was Luke's friend, he would just go away. Now what ended up happening with him is he came back the day that we got our first angel investment uh, term sheet. We also got a letter from an attorney um, saying that this guy wanted our company, we needed to leave and that he would take over control because we wrongly um, kicked him out of the company and stole his equity from him, even though he agreed to walk away. Uh, and so, yes, you, you can hire somebody who you think is your friend before they're a business partner, and that can definitely come back to hurt you. Now, what that did to us is whenever you're trying to raise money, if there's a legal issue going on, 
that deal is basically dead. And you have to disclose it legally to your investors before they sign that term sheet. So Luke got the term sheet and then had to call them and say, hey, uh, by the way, literally 10 minutes ago, we found out we're getting sued, right? And so luckily for us, we had built great relationships with them and we were able to find, you know, businesses always need to find solutions to problems that you never knew existed. And we were able to find our way out of that. But that was a very expensive problem to solve. And, and had we have known, you know, how to better look at the types of friends using this strategy that we talked about today, like, did he have the competencies that we needed for him to fulfill the role? We would have known a long time ago that wasn't a person we should have started the business with. Now, on the other hand, I knew somebody that I went to high school with named Mark, and he's a co-founder and he's still with us today. He's our VP of integrations and partnerships, works right next to me at the desk next to me. And we met when we were in like 10th grade when I stole his girlfriend. That's how we met. Uh, but I knew he had the competencies to fill the roles that we needed at the time and get us to the next level. But I didn't put myself as the hiring decision. I made it a committee decision and I sort of absolved myself from being a part of it. And Luke and the other co-founders decided to bring Mark in because of his competencies, because we had a scorecard and because we knew what we were looking for. And Mark's worked out to be one of the best teammates we brought on as a co-founder, um, you know, since that date. And so it does go both ways, but by using the types of strategies we talk today, you'll be in a better position to know if one of your friends is actually a fit and, and has the competencies to help build your business versus you just hiring them because they're your friend. And that's the big difference right there. You're welcome. Sorry, I'm on mute. I just realized. Uh, do we have any questions out there from the audience is what I was asking. And if not, I wanted yeah, to I have, ask. A, I have a question. Oh. oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who is this? This is Ben. Hi, Ben. Hey, um, so I have a question about, so we've got the team, uh, I've got a team at Zip Launchpad in the Lava Launch Center, and we've got a great uh, company culture that we actually just went through and built like the brand guidelines, the company guidelines, and we all work well together. Uh, but now my question for you is, how do you, um, like, do you have any tips or advice or books on how to really make sure that everybody is like doing the best they can and has all the resources they need and kind of like internal management tools? Because we find that we get kind of um, off track a bit and still like thinking great things, but sometimes we get off the track and unfocused. Um, yes. So, so one of the things that we, that we adopted is this concept of OKRs. So like one, one key result, right. And, and so getting off of things like, um, you know, some people say KPIs, like what are our key performance indicators? Sometimes you want to get more, you know, measured around what are the OKRs that everybody's achieving. So there's a book that, that I'll um, send over to Tanya that maybe she can share. And I don't know if you guys know, but there's a, a resource right now called Scribe. It's an app that you can download and it's unlimited audio audiobooks and they're giving it away for free for 30 days while this whole virus thing is going on. So if you guys want to get access to all the books that we, I mean, our company pays for scribed as a part of our employee development program, because when we hire you, we have an expectation that you're going to continuously learn in your, in your field. And these, this is where we find books to do that. Um, some that I would suggest for you guys, you know, if you're, if you feel like you've got a culture established and you, you're sort of writing out, you know, like the, the charter, I guess you can say of how that's supposed to be managed. Um, also make sure that you have ways to measure the performance, right? And so a lot of the times with us, you know, we, we always had weekly meetings. We were known at the Zon Center as the weekend warriors because we met every Sunday for eight hours a day. And we always had small standups, right? And so if you're familiar with the agile, you know, development process, or maybe these, what, what they would call scrum development. Um, it's basically the, the idea that every two weeks you need to check in and make sure that what you're building is what the market's asking for based on what you have learned during that time period. And we adopted that agile sort of approach as a leadership team to where it's built into our calendars that each of us that has a specific role, we all have our own OKRs that we're supposed to be tackling that lead to this one major company goal that we're trying to hit. And if you're working on anything that doesn't lead to that goal, you're wrong. And we're going to find out what your time's being spent on when we do these, these stand up meetings that happen. Basically sometimes, you know, we do them once a week, you know, with our teams. Now we do them every Friday. Um, the development team, they do them every day. Right. And so depending on how, how frequent you need to meet and what type of systems you have, you might need to use in-person meetings to keep people on track until you have a good way of tracking your projects in a system. We eventually use things like Asana, you know, so we can actually have task management 
Um, there's a lot of different tools out there to help get your team on the same page. Slack's being used in a lot of creative ways. Um, but it's just, it's just making sure that you guys keep everybody focused on the same goals and have a way to measure whether or not the overall team is helping you get there. And OKRs is a great way to do that. OKR? Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually share something with you guys real quick. I just want to find the name of the book. Um, let me look that up. While you're doing that, I'll, I'll recommend a book that I, I loved reading. It's called uh, Getting Things Done. Getting Things Done. And that's uh, the subheading of that is The Art of Stress-Free Productivity by David Allen. That's just a great book. Um, so I'm going to put this in the chat room. It's just a link to the book, but it's called Measure What Matters. And it's, it's written about how Google and all these big companies are setting up you know, how, how they manage such a big organization to achieve such big results. Um, so this is the link to the book here. Now you could probably find this inscribed and listen to this for free in the next 30 days. Oh, sorry. I just messaged it to somebody who messaged me. So let me send this to everyone. Okay. So that's the link. That's what it is on Amazon. Um, that's what I use. I have audible as well. So whenever, you know, I can't find a book over there, I use my, my credits. But this book right here is, is what we use to restructure our company to get off these sort of artificial, you know, we just want to accomplish these tasks and, and help us focus on a key company vision with actual measurable, measurable steps of contribution where everybody helps get us to there. And it keeps everybody on track. So you're not spending time on things that don't get you to the next milestone, especially early on. The answer awesome. to almost all your questions you're going to know is, is I'm just going to recommend a book because that's all we've done is we've just stole other people's ideas and used what worked for us. So whatever your question is, I'll tell you the book that you should read about it and I'll give you the story of how we did it. Okay, that works. That works. So I, uh, uh, Ben, was that, did you have any uh, follow-up question or? Oh, no, uh, no, I think that was pretty much it. I mean, we're using Asana right now. We tried out Trello and a couple other ones. Um, mm -hmm but I think Asana is what we're sticking to. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, also the other thing is like meeting frameworks, like how to set that up from like start to finish um, with like action points or like key topics to talk about. Um, but I think it sounds like that Measure What Matters book will have some good uh, guidelines to get through that. Right, because and, and your meetings will start to be focused around like these key these key results that you guys are trying to achieve, and so it's measurable. Are you getting it done or not? It's binary, ones or zeros. It's not, you know, I, I made a hundred calls. Like nobody cares if you made a hundred calls. How many people did you sell when you made the hundred calls, right? And so the the key result is the sale, but the KPI might be the phone call. And so it's getting you away from the leading types of things and getting you focused on what you're actually trying to achieve. Got it. Um, I see another one from CJ. Okay. Uh, in building your team, is it more important that individuals share your same vision for the company's future or are they just willing to help? Uh, I, so that's a great question. So that depends on what mentality they have. Some, when we were at San Diego State building a student team, there were students who just wanted the experience while they were there because nobody would hire them while they were in school, but they can come to us and work on a marketing campaign and run our social media ads so that they can put that on their resume for when they did graduate. Right. And so if you're talking about students, it depends, right? We had, we had some foreign exchange students who can only be there for a year. And so we knew that's all they had. And so we just had to make sure that we had, you know, whatever they thought was, you know, I want to be able to go back home with, you know, a resume that says I did contracting work in the United States and we would pay them, you know, a small stipend to be able to do that from our Zon fund, you know, or something like that. And so um, you, you really have to understand who you're hiring, right? And, and during that interview process, you'll determine if they're temporary help or somebody who can be in here for the long haul. And once you start putting things in place, when we get to the, the slicing pie webinar, when we talk about equity management and how to incentivize people over the long run um, and you plug them into that system, you'll start to see who's just going to be an intern versus who's going to step up. Cause we've had interns come in who have turned into co-founders, right? So no, nobody in a startup, that's the beautiful thing is you don't necessarily uh, end where you begin. It's, you never know who's going to shine. And so we brought guys on for specific projects that are now co-founders with equity in our company. And we had co-founders who are no longer with us. Right. And so you've got to determine that as you go. Um, and so having the same vision is, is good, but also understanding their intentions is required. Um, in, in addition to that. So I know that uh, we, um, Ryan and Sonia, I was going to say, I know we, we are at the rec going to be helping um, 
a lot of the teams find the interns. Um, and, and one of the questions that I've had from actually a couple of the students is, how do we, how do we make the most of the interns that we're bringing in and how do we make sure that we clarify uh, to them that this is really for experience and, and uh, so that we don't have to deal with any issues down the road of them um, coming back and saying, I, I deserve part of the company because I worked there for a year at the beginning. Yeah, so for us, what we did was we were very clear in what, what was called scope of work, right? And so the way that we first learned about this was there was actually classes at San Diego State. And so those of you guys who are in the Zip Launchpad, um, we had, I don't know how many different classes where the instructors came to the Zip Center and they had end of semester project that students need to work on, whether it was marketing or uh, market research, whatever they were doing. And um, they would come and say, we need a, they have to go out and find a company, right? So they can go into San Diego businesses and try to find any company that lets them do it and see if that works. But you're also right there on the campus. And so we went to all the teachers and the business programs and sent an email and said, hey, if you guys are looking for any companies to be involved on any of your team's projects, when we got marketing teams working on our, our branding and our, our uh, you know, our, our letterheads and, and our, even like our, our company swag, they were giving suggestions and creating new logo options. They did all that business cards, everything you would need. They, they built it all and they presented like six different teams and we picked a team at the end and then they got prize money from the class and we got the work for free just because we were a team that, that volunteered to be a part of their learning experience. And that happens everywhere, whether, you know, we need market research right now. We just got an MBA class sent over from Alex DeNoble's, you know, MBA program. Mm -hmm. And they're doing all kind of market research for us now on other markets that we can go into with the features that we have now. And they're doing it for free because it's a class project and they need a company to volunteer it, right? So that's different from internships, but you're getting really high value by letting other people do the work and using yeah. their expertise to produce results that you can then bring into your business. Um, so that's one of the ways that we do it at the school is we look for the types of classes that would have projects that would help us build our business quicker than if we were to try to learn everything about branding and marketing ourselves. Why not get six different presentations in portfolio format and what we found was those teachers were writing scope of work for the students. So we adopted that, not really understanding what that was, but intuitively that leads to project management. And if you understand your scope of work is to complete a project and here's what you get for the project, then there is no question because they signed the scope of work and nothing in there says that they get equity. So it's really about positioning yourself and being very transparent about what the project encompasses, what they get for it. And, and sometimes you do have to do a stipend, right? Like there were times where we brought somebody in and you couldn't in California have an intern work for free, but we needed them in this capacity. So we just decided to give them a thousand dollar stipend out of our company budget so that we can get this done and still be in compliance with the state. So, you know, but we got great work and, it's, and instead of going to an agency, we just paid a team a thousand dollars, right? Versus an agency, which would have been 15 grand for the same project. But we didn't need a corporate level, you know, project. We needed a startup level project and that was our budget. That was a resource and we took advantage of it. And those uh, the students who are, who are in the rec, we do have a lot of uh, students in classes that are going to be doing their class projects for your, um, you know, for your companies. And that's part of the, the meetings that we'll be having in the next, over the next week or so with me doing the needs assessment um, to see which of you could benefit from, from having uh, branding, design, developers, coders, et cetera, et cetera, working on their projects uh, for you. So. It should be something good. Okay, I saw another question here, and I uh, kind of, oh, it was it was actually uh, Josh. Josh, did you have a question for Ryan? Josh McFall, if you're still in there, I don't know. Oh no, I'm here. Um, okay. I did have a question, but he kind of already answered it. I was just asking about um, because my team's not at the point yet where we're looking to more people on or necessarily need the resources yet, but. When we do get to that point, I was just looking for strategies and how we can get to people to kind of want to work for us for free, not have to give them an equity either. Sorry, you cut out the last part there. Can you say just the last part again? Um, just to kind of get like people to want to work for the startup company and not necessarily paying them or wanting about equity. Right. Yeah. So, so this is, this is like the story of us for like our first 90 days. Like we didn't give any stock to any developers and we were running just based on a story. Right. And so I had mentioned before, and I say this kind of jokingly, but nobody comes out for a shitty story. 
So if you're a founding team and you don't have a way to sell your vision and sell your story in a way that inspires somebody, you need to go back and think about what is your company vision statement? You know, what are you guys trying to accomplish? Because nobody's just going to sign up to be in a startup and invest that kind of resources unless they feel like there's a value from it, right? We're all creatures of what, what, you know, kind of self-preservation, but also reward, right? So if I feel like, you know, you just need me to come in just to do this, just to build your company, but you don't actually care about my experience, right? You're not there to teach me anything. I'm not going to grow with you. Um, that's not something I'm going to sign up for. And so the only thing you really have to offer when you don't have money is offer a good story because people will come out for it. And so for me, you know, I, I don't know if everybody knows my story, but when I was starting this company, I was just coming off of being a cancer survivor. And, you know, I, I was just rolling the dice on this and, and wanting to do something to take a shot while I was already broke. You know, I was living on unemployment and all that. So it was just like, here's one chance for me to try this before. And a lot of people latched on to the, you know, when I was a leader in the company, I would tell people about my story and where I came from and how I got there and what this meant to me and how I had kids who, you know, in, in my family who had never had business owners before. And I wanted to create opportunities for other people to have the same experience while we were students. And we can never guarantee millions of dollars and we can never guarantee great salaries, but we did guarantee an environment where you'd be challenged. We would guarantee that you would walk away with far more for your tuition than you would with a student who did not join your team. Everybody's there paying the same money to go to school and take the same amount of classes and get the same boxes checked on their degree, but not everybody's walking away having helped build, you know, or even been in a startup or had the opportunity to be innovative, right? And those are all skills that, that, Companies and corporations love to hire, right? People want to hire entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in their business. They just don't know how to, how to identify them. And so this helps, this, this is something you can sell to college students that helps them set themselves apart from all the other students who are going to be competing for jobs with them after, right? So if you want to bring on people who are looking to boost their resume, that was the whole reason I went and met with Luke. I really just wanted a bullet point on my resume and I became a co-founder because I was willing to, to build the business with them. But at the end of the day, you guys have something to offer that not a lot of people can. Nobody's hiring these students right now until they graduate and they need to have work experience to get hired, right? It's that catch 22 of being a student where they're like, not enough experience, right? And you're like, well, I just graduated. How am I supposed to get experience if you won't hire me? You guys are the solution to that problem. And if you can sell that and then have a good leadership story to keep them coming back. And for us, honestly, spicy chicken nugget sandwiches on Sunday helped a lot. Um, they, they always loved when we, when we ditched the, the jack in the box on them. Uh, but those are ways you guys can use your student, you know, experience now and leverage that to give people value without having to give up your company. Awesome. Thank you. And um, I saw one more question there. I don't know, Ryan, if you see that from uh, TCXR, I think that's Ray. How did you balance your internship learning with maintaining your schedule? Um, so one of the ways we did that was we never brought them on for work that we didn't think they can do. So one of the, one of the big mistakes that we used to make at the start was we would bring them in and sometimes we would spend more time correcting their work than we would getting value from them actually doing the work. And while, yes, they're supposed to have a learning experience, they're supposed to be, you know, a symbiotic relationship between them learning and us getting value. So sometimes you got to make sure you understand the work you're asking them to do and whether or not these interns have the capacity to do it and, and don't over prescribe or, or you know get your expectations too high on what internship help can do um sometimes you know sometimes it can come back to bite you right not all internships work out but then other times you, you will pull you know great from an intern you can get an employee and from an employee you can become a co-founder we've had three different interns that started with us that all have equity in our company today once we put the the stock pool in place for employees um, and so I, I would always kind of Balance it between making it easy on yourself and giving them something that's low risk, but easy to do and something that, you know, you can do a quick QA process on and make sure it's right. Uh, but don't give them things that is going to cost you more time to get a successful result from it um, than it would if you just did it yourself or hired an expert to do it. Um, you just kind of got to balance that, the, the giving them an opportunity to learn versus taking away value from your business, uh, you know, back and forth. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, do we have any other questions out there? All right, then I thank you so much, Ryan. I can't thank you enough for this wonderful workshop. I think that we all got a lot of value out of it. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the workshops um, this semester. And I'll share those with, with, with all of you. Um, I, you know, at, at one point, I think we had over 70 um, attendees, which I 
was expecting maybe 20 tops. So this was a really, really great turnout. I think a lot of people are bored these days. When you're on self-isolation, <laughs> anything's entertainment. So <laughs> thank you guys for coming.